You're listening to Off Color, a podcast where we keep it real and talk about race and identity. I'm your host, Rebecca Henderson, a.k.a. The Tan Tigress, and I have in the studio with me the lovely Janice Motsko, our intrepid producer. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey! Welcome back, Off Color fam. Hope you survived the holidays, and if you didn't, my deepest condolences. This is part two of episode three, because episode three was so lit, we could not cut it down. And we want to make sure you get all that good information and knowledge, and start learning how to live an anti-racist life. Okay? For this episode, we brought back Samuel Gonzalez, who you know him, you love him. He needs no introduction. And we have community organizer Danilo Valladares from New Orleans. And we also have a very special phone-in guest. The late, great Dr. Gregory Diggs' brother, Brian Diggs, joins us from L.A. Danilo, why don't you tell us about yourself? Tell me about your ministry. What's your passion? Um... My ministry, my passion, my focus, I think it's uh, being able to partner uh, with workers in a equal playing field, just kind of uh, trying to look uh, differently at the relationship between organizer, labor organizer, community organizer, and folks in the community, whether you are from the community or you're just transplanted into it. And I think for me, um, it's being able to build, um, build uh, within the movement uh, with directly affected people, also understanding my my identity, understanding my struggle, my community, and being able to do that with people of color, with affected people. And uh, the most recent work that I was doing it with, uh, or the folks I was doing it with, is with guest work, being able to build with people that are directly impacted, that are leading the work, that are you know strategizing, that are tacticians, that are being thought partners. And not brought into the fold after the fact, after mm-hmm. some college kids, after some organizer who's been at it for 15 years mm-hmm. and never has really held a job or really uh, struggled within the context that workers uh, understand and know and live through. And I think, you know, in itself uh, is also racist uh, mm-hmm. to not uh, give people the opportunity to fail within their own movements, their own struggles. And uh, building um, an organization of seafood workers that are guest workers coming from Mexico. Uh, to Louisiana uh, to process crawfish uh, and it's uh, workers that are coming to uh, slave-like conditions. Uh, There's workers that come um, after having borrowed maybe uh, $1,000 to make the trip over here and once their season is done uh, they go back with zero dollars so they actually have to overstay uh, their visas so they can make some money to go back home. Uh, So it's uh, really uh, being able to build with those group of workers uh, a voice and an organizing effort to actually counteract a lot of the abuses, both uh, physical, uh, mental, uh, stealing uh, paychecks, sexual abuse, uh, and building a community of workers to uh, stop those abuses and to start changing the uh, relationship of power between uh, the employers here in the U.S. and workers that are coming from poor communities, but also have a lot of dignity and respect for themselves and uh you know and they want to see a, a lot of that change and so it's doing that in a way that's not dreaming it up for them but also uh counting them as the folks that are actually going to tell us how us here in the u.s can help them have a better life a working life here um, and not really direct them on how they should be doing that sounds like your work is incredible um i I am really thankful that there are people like you out there trying to, to taking care of this particular community, um, especially at this time. All right, Brian, would you go ahead and introduce yourself? Well, my name is Brian C. Tiggs. I'm an actor, singer, dancer, uh, former game developer, uh, IT person. I just had a, I just, I'm working on my BFA, so I have one more class before I get my Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. And um, for the first time, I uh, experienced uh, blatant racism in the classroom from a 70-year-old white teacher of a dances in American culture class. So uh, I'm uh, he is in a mood. I wanted to, I wanted to talk <laughs> about 
that experience again because it does fall into this idea of the myth of a, of intentionality this teacher thinks she's teaching um a dance class a cultural dance class and feels like she's being very inclusive mm. uh so brian would you mind sharing a little bit about your teacher's um lessons i guess yeah so this teacher is a 70 year old white woman the name of the class is dance in american cultures which i thought would be great i wouldn't be just getting this european point of view <laughs> first um, mistake <laughs> <laughs> but she started the class by saying class i can teach everyone a dance that you can do right in your seats come on everybody do it with me I'm going to teach you an Eskimo dance. Mm. And she clasps her shoulder, I mean, she clasps her elbows and she shivers. No, no she <laughs> wow. Because it's cold there. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Wow. That's how she starts the class. Mm. Uh, Danger, Will Robinson. Can, can I interject and say kudos for the voice acting? What? <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? I felt, that was I there. felt like you were. I felt like I was there. Yeah. 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 So then she asked the class, um, how many people in class like ballet? And about five people. So this is a class of 80 students. About five people raised their hand. And, um, and she says, how many of you like hip-hop? And a bunch of people raise their hands. And she says, yes, because it's easy for you to identify with hip-hop, but it's difficult for you to identify with kings and queens. Woo! <laughs> so Dangerous. We do not have a textbook. We have a study guide that she wrote <laughs> that we have to pay for. <laughs> no citations. Uh, no, um, yeah, no citations in there. It's just her notes. Um, and so, you know, <laughs> we get these racist microaggressions every so often, but then this, this stuff is blatantly wrong. Um, so I had to start correcting her. I happen to have danced, uh, a little ballet, but mostly modern and jazz in college. I danced, uh, swing for many years. I danced salsa for many years and bachata. And, some of the stuff she talks about, I'm like, yeah, that's just not true. Yeah, that's not true. Where, where's your source? She actually reported me for breaking code of conduct by correcting her too often in class. We went in the swing section, and she started um, um, citing white people for developing the rhythms of swing. Hmm. And when I said, um, no, you have to talk about Count Basie and... Um, uh, Duke, uh, Duke Ellington, and you, you, you got to talk about these other people. Um, she says, Oh, there's no time. If you want to do that, then you have to uh, email me. And I'm like, No, if you attribute the development of swing to white people, I'm going to correct that in class. Because mm. it should be corrected in class. Right. We got to the 60s, and she says, The twist is responsible for bringing awareness to Americans for the first time the issues of racial injustice. In the 60s? <laughs> the twist. Uh, the dance, the twist. Uh, and I'm like, the twist did not bring, because African Americans are American, and are you saying that African Americans were not aware of racial injustice before 1960? <laughs> before the twist? Um, but they basically said she can lie in the classroom if she wants to. Uh, oh. Teachers have broad discretion to teach what they want, and we're not allowed to correct to, to, to correct them in the classroom. But I'm going to fight that now they got my grades. But, um, mm. you know, I was not expecting to experience that in 2019. Wow. Yeah. No. I was not expecting to have to tell my neighbors that keeping the name Stapleton, voting to keep that name is a racist act of aggression. Right. You brought up microaggressions. I think this is a good set segue into that. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. microaggression. What is a microaggression? So technically, a microaggression, these sound like macroaggressions. 
Like, these are real. Like, <laughs> I think the the Eskimo, which is an incorrect, they're Inuit. Uh, that's one. That's a microaggression, right? And that's that can be like just some bias that that has been built in there, and she hasn't bothered to correct it or fix it. Right. Um, but that's a microaggression. Um, but the fact that she is actually denying Black history around dance and music, that's a that's not a microaggression. That's outright blatant like lies, and that I would consider a, a macroaggression. Microaggressions are like paper cuts. They're like little things that like like it hurts every time you try to pick something up or whatever. Um, and so that's what a micro that would qualify. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm going to give one more example, and then I'm going to give more. I knew you had so, more. I knew it. <laughs> yeah, oh, I've got a whole semester worth. Mm -hmm. We were talking about um, the influence of Puerto Ricans on dance in America. And so she says that um, between, I think it's between 1920 and 1940, um, like it was like 10,000 Puerto Ricans came from the islands over to New York. And then between 1940 and 1960, 40,000 Puerto Ricans came from the islands to um, New York. And she said, so imagine, close your eyes. Come on, we're imagining here. Close your eyes and imagine all these people are coming over from the islands and they have a different culture than you, and they're darker than you. I'm like, darker than who? Because <laughs> this is not just a class full of white people. And even if, even if they are darker than me, who, who cares? But the problem with this one and, and the Eskimo example is that she's making us complicit mm. in the racism mm. because she's getting us to partic physically participate Come on, do the dance with me. Come on, close your eyes and imagine what it's like to be a racist. Like, <laughs> oh, wow. You know, hmm. it's, it's almost indescribable, but, but she's making you complicit in feeling what it's like to be a racist, hmm. not just being a victim of racism. And where uh, power plus prejudice equals racism uh to be the 70 year old white woman who is telling the black man, no, you cannot correct me in class when I make a mistake. And since you did, I'm going to report you. I mean, I feel like that happens so frequently. And I've, I, as always, I'm always struggling with, am I, am I doing too much? Right. Am I, is it my fault that like this has risen to a level of uh, confrontation that perhaps I'm not, you know, I, I'm I'm culpable for that. If I raise my hand and you call on me, I'm like, this is class participation. Like I, I'm not yeah, jumping out of like my seat. Like a community meeting. This is a community <laughs> meeting, and I'm a property owner. Well, and then you know, there's I did finally get the angry black man. I got the angry black right. I mean, <laughs> I'm laughing because Re Rebecca has experienced me. He's like this gentle uh, person. He just like sings his. He was in hair in Russia, like in Russian. In Russian. Like, wow. Just, Can you get a taste? Can we get a taste? Yeah. yeah. Let's just, get a sample. Um. Dobro da i pani manja, miri do ti proti tanja, a prašetjem je žaleja, sjodit era vadaleja, o vadalje, o vadalje. That is wild. So what I'm saying is he's not um, any kind of of threatening type person or. Yeah, yeah but I don't think you had. I mean, in, in, in this particular group, I don't think that you had to qualify that. But it's hilarious that. Yeah, that we did. Right. The, the, the thing that seems to be happening is that uh, there are these quote unquote nice white people who think that because they're not being hateful, they're not being racist. And even with the Stapleton, right? Well, you know, I didn't know what the Stapleton name came from. I thought it came from the airport, you know, and so I didn't know. And so it should be okay. And I don't hate black people, so it should be okay. 
And I told them that it is okay for them to be racist, but just know that you're being racist and I'm just telling you and now you have information so don't be don't get all butthurt if someone calls you a racist if you are doing racist things is what I'm trying you to say. You can't use that word. You can't use that word just because I disagree with you. Ooh. <laughs> it hurts. Though. Everybody everybody has prejudice, right? Yeah. Everybody's prejudiced against something. I don't hear color. <laughs> <laughs> right. That's why I love that statement that you made though of the the power Plus prejudice right. equals racism. Right. And that's what right. you're talking about, especially in the Stapleton case. Mm. You're talking about people who have power to change something and their prejudice is leading them to not change it, which makes right. it racist. <laughs> I feel like when people get are upset about the name thing, right, or we want to talk about it, people are like, why? Just like, whatever. So I don't feel comfortable with that. I feel like we should talk about it because I'm saying, hey, the neighborhood is named after a guy that was in the Ku Klux Klan, and I, we would like to change that name if it's possible. Is that possible? Can we change the name, or can you just stop like using it on your branding material? Right. Don't perpetuate the legacy. Yeah, like, we don't need to celebrate it. And then everyone went crazy and was like, no, you guys are the racists for talking about race. Last night, in the spirit of Dr. Diggs, I went to the community meeting for the Master Community Association, and I was a write-in candidate for the neighborhood. I'm a critical race theorist. I am a resident of Stapleton. I didn't want to actually run, even though I organize community-wide events here in Stapleton. I hosted things here at the Cube. I do have a particular focus on race and identity because I feel like everyone should feel welcome and included here. And as someone who does not feel welcome and included here, I would love to be that voice on the Master Community Association to kind of help plan events that are culturally relevant instead of just saying we have black musicians, this is diversity. I would really just love for you guys to consider writing me in as a candidate, I, I would be very honored to serve on this board. I am not part of the Change the Name Stapleton group either. I just have certain feelings about it, and that's okay. And I think it would be nice to have a rep, true representation of the community who lives here. I've been a resident of Stapleton since 2014, and I do hope you'll consider. Thank you. Um, I spoke publicly, I addressed my neighbors and let them know that I was feeling some kind of way about the name Stapleton. Like somebody wants to know more about this topic and I feel like this podcast is a great way for me to have to, that I can just say my piece, right? I can just say it and you can like receive the information or not receive it, but you're going to get my perspective. I understand your perspective. I know your perspective. I don't have to pretend to be a racist imagining Puerto Rican people coming, like, right? We're all already complicit. Yeah. Right. So I just wanted to bring that up, talk about it, let people know that's the feeling. And they really did not like it. And one of the the one of my neighbors said, you know, are you calling us all racists? And I said, no, I just said everyone who voted to keep the name Stapleton is upholding white supremacy and racism. But I do think like you're my neighbors. And I look at you and I think, oh, they're racists. They don't care that it bothers me as a black person. They don't care. That's fine, you can feel that way and you can say you don't, but I'm telling you, that's how I feel living here. Are you calling everybody here racists? Is that what you're saying? I'm calling everyone who voted to keep the name of Stapleton uh, an upholder of white supremacy and racism. Uh. How about that? You also want yeah. to You can, you can. So, but I thought this was a community meeting, it, that's it all. Is, I'm is. a property so, owner too. That's what I'm saying. So you can receive that information however you want to. I don't think we should have to be quiet about the things we want to talk about. And I that was my experience. And I wish that people could could hear that. And I'm always being told that I will not get my message across. I will not. People can't hear me because of the way in which I present stuff. You saw it before, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Yeah, I saw the video. Yeah. Um, I saw 
in, in my eyes a person of color talking to white people that look to be above the age of 70 um, that maybe had never been called racist before which I don't know if that's true uh, or not but just by their reactions yeah, or obscenities for that matter <laughs> <laughs> and 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 yeah, and, and I saw the speaker. You, uh, yeah, not really watering down the message uh, for that crowd. Like, re not really needing to explain or to do the labor of educating white people. Uh, and 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 I thought that was powerful because uh, oftentimes uh, people of color have to explain to white people what it is is that is being brought to them and why. And that gets tiring after a while. And you also start to lose a little bit of I think what you are bringing to begin with some authenticity and, and your whole self when you start to have to explain every single time, this is why you don't understand me. Uh, so yeah, I thought it was great. And uh, uh, you also read a response from- uh, Oh yeah, should I read it? Yes, yeah, so from somebody that was there. It. Yeah, while you look that up, um, I you mentioned like people of color shouldn't have to do the emotional labor of educating white people that's uh, not their job yeah. um so a couple of years ago i found this resource resource i don't know if you've heard of it it's called white nonsense roundup mm -hmm. i use them all the time it's pretty fantastic hmm. they have a facebook presence a twitter presence i believe they're on instagram but basically you can tag them if somebody is is making your butt popping hurt. off. If somebody's making your butt hurt. <laughs> yeah, you can tag them, and they will jump in and do the uh, the educational labor, heavy lifting, um, in so that you don't have to extend hmm. yourself. Yeah, yeah. So I, we we need that in real life. Yes. Committees Follow of white yes. people yeah. actually getting offline as well. And well, you know yes. who wasn't there last night? Those white people. I'll tell you that <laughs> shit. So anyway, I'm going to read what one of the neighbors wrote after I gave that rousing speech that you have heard. Does anyone know the name of the woman at the MCA meeting last night who requested opportunity for a candidate speech because she was a write-in? It's apparent to me she wants everyone to know who she is. <laughs> okay, I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> I want to invite her to, to a follow-up conversation so I can better understand her positions. She did not seem overly happy with how things are being handled and her concerns about race relations in Stapleton. Should anyone else be interested in joining such an invitation, PM me or mention it here here in the comments we are not going to get anywhere productive on this topic with the kind of atmosphere present last night i found myself being hostile and irritated toward her and i feel like a, i for one can do better alternatively maybe we can suggest a community forum on the topic at the cube but the ground rules that we are there to unite to listen and to express freely since one of my trigger phrases is you are all white supremacists maybe there is opportunity for me to grow and i suspect she might just be inclined to help me that this is it i can't be going to that meeting man mm. <laughs> i'm just going to explain my Didn't position they host multiple conversations before the vote <sighs> they did i don't know who went to them i didn't go because I don't have time for that, but um, I don't think that they talked to the people they needed to talk to, perhaps, mm -hmm. or they didn't have the right facilitators, or I'm not really sure. I I like community conversations, and I like extending mm -hmm, that to people mm -hmm. so people can like sit down and talk, but I do, and at the same time, I think people don't usually come with an open heart. I know my heart isn't really that open, and I think the reason it's not open is because I'm like, y no, like you're, you're 100% wrong. Like I'm 100% mm -hmm. right in this case, in this case. Like we can talk about other stuff, but like just even today, our lovely guest said, I, I, he said, oh, well, who, who's the neighborhood named after? What was the, I said, Mayor Ben Stapleton. He was in the in the Ku Klux Klan. And that's it. That's like enough. Don't you think that should be mm -hmm. enough? Shouldn't be surprising at this point. I feel like as a person of color and an immigrant uh, coming to this country at uh, five years old and being sold this idea of the U.S. and then slowly by... Uh, talking uh to folks that are not white and listening to their experiences here in the u.s yeah at, at first it was surprising you know learning american history uh and then it's not 
the more you hear about it. And then it's not, it's like, it's, it's commonplace. And I think white people have a vested interest in, 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 in their pride of uh, not being told that they were wrong. Uh, maybe that one person, I appreciate that woman's uh, response uh, and her openness to want to be educated. But yeah. again, it goes back to like, why does that labor have to fall on you to explain uh, their racism? Well, I tell you why it falls on me personally, because I'm half white. And so I feel like I have mm. uh, uh, my proximity to whiteness. Mm. And I sometimes I'm like, well, I'll do it because I can because I have the privilege and the and the luxury to be able to do it. And so I will call people out. That's kind of my style. I'm like mm. known for it. Like, I feel like if it was anything else, then oh, I, I don't know. Like if I just said, oh, I just feel like unwelcome, you know, but it's not. And I didn't even talk about the the, the racial profiling on all of our our Facebook groups and stuff. Right. They saw a, a, a black kid running with a backpack and they were like, call the popo, you know, and everyone's mm. like, dude, kids run with backpacks. You only call the cops because he was black. Right. So I didn't even bring that up. I was mm -hmm, just saying mm -hmm. we want to change the name because it sounds racist and people don't want to move here. Somebody wrote to me right on my Twitters. We were thinking of buying in Stapleton. Then we saw the vote and we decided not to. Stapleton, you have a brand problem. And I'm not I don't live there anymore. I live in Central Park West. Is that what <laughs> the, was being proposed? Is the, the name being changed to? No, 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 oh. no. What were the recommendations mm -hmm. for who cares? Alternatives. There is. I just. Oh. I was just curious. I feel like that is the question everyone asked, and I don't. I, okay, it's a reasonable question. You're like, what are the alternatives? Anything, man. We'll call it Central Park. Fair. We'll call it Northeast Denver. We'll call it. We'll call it Westerly Creek because the Rebecca creek there is. We'll call it Rebecca Town. <laughs> <laughs> I like Rebecca Town because when I was there about six or seven months ago, I was walking around thinking, why can't it be named after a woman? Yeah. What? 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 Uh, why does it have to be a man, and why does it have to be a white man? So that's one of the names. So a suggestion is like the Justina Ford neighborhood, because she was the first black doctor in Colorado. She couldn't practice here because she was black, but she was, she delivered like mm -hmm. thousands of babies in her home as a as a doctor. Um, yeah, I don't think it's in. Uh, to me, it doesn't matter what the pro proposal is. Is that we had they, that we have to even ask them to change it instead of just letting them do it. And some of the developers are pushing away, right? And they just call it. They say twelve neighborhoods strong, and they just say our zip code eight zero two three eight. You know, because people are understanding that this is something people do care about. So even though this this issue comes up again and again, and the reason, and so Brian, I know you've been on the phone a long time, but like the reason I, I've been thinking a lot about HBO's. Watchmen series uh, starring Regina King. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that guy that was in the Get Down Cadillac. I can never remember mm. that dude's name. Wonderful. Yeah. Fabulous. Yeah. <laughs> can I get a sit down? <laughs> yeah, that guy is so fine. So Watchmen. Watchmen is a show from the HBO that is based on a comic book of the same name. I The original story is nothing like this adaptation. This adaptation is a serious study, I think, in racial trauma, the United States history, as well as science fiction and some other shit where you get you begin surprised on that show. Like, what? Mm -hmm. I mean, it just takes a turn left, then right, then back again, then around two times, and then you're like, wait a minute. What am I watching? Yeah, but you can't stop. Mm -hmm. You can't stop. So, I stopped. It. Sam, why did you stop? Why did you stop? A, the first episode, the first scene, the first like 30 seconds in, I was traumatized, re-traumatized. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that, was, that was way more than I was ready for. Um, my colleague, my uh, Diana, who you've met and you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, has lineage that goes back to Black Wall Street. Um, and in fact, is one of her nicknames, like, they call her Black Wall Street. Mm -hmm. um, so there's too. a tie for me there. Mm -hmm. But just to see black people on, on screen be the uh, Im the immediate thing, uh, re rece recipients of violence at the onset of this story, I was like, uh, <laughs> I wasn't ready. And so that was, that was just too much. And I'm very, very sensitive to violence, specifically to people of color, more specifically to black people. Yeah, I, th I think it was hard to tell in the beginning for almost anybody starting to watch it that it was going to start with 
uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, yeah. Black Wall Street, yeah. and a lot of people still, you know, don't know anything about it. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I can imagine uh, how hard it could be to prepare for that. So I saw it because I knew that's what it was about, and so when I started to watch it, I was I was ready because I read some mm-hmm, stuff about mm-hmm. it. So I'm sorry, you're right. I'm operating from my perspective. It was it was sort of like when I read Octavia Butler for the first mm. time. I was like, holy <laughs> fuck! I was not ready for any of that, and so that was really it's just really hard for me to get yeah. through that. Um, and so I'm not saying that I won't get through it. I just now I have a, a better idea. Yeah, and I know what it will take for me to prepare. Yeah, appreciate the awareness out of be able to put pause when you have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting that you say that you weren't prepared because you at least knew something about it. White folks really weren't prepared because they knew nothing about it, which is why it's even in the show, is because Damon Lindelof was like, why don't I know? He read about it from Ta-Nehisi Coates, and he's like, why do I not know about this? And when he talked to white people about what well, when he talked to black people about it, they were like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yep, yep, that's how that happened. And when he talked to white people, he's like, what are you talking about? I never heard about that. That didn't really happen. And he's like, uh, no, like, this really happened. Facts. So that's why it's even in there, is because white people didn't know. Wait, Janice, um, did you know about it? Janice is white. See, no. this is why you want to clarify, because a name like Janice, okay, sorry, Janice. I'm not asking you to justify <laughs> No, I have heard about it. Um, I certainly did not learn about it in school or anything along those lines. It's been in my adult life, but I, I was aware of it. I don't know that I knew how violent and extensive it was, but I knew it was like mm-hmm. one of the only instances of the, uh, the military specifically dropping bombs mm-hmm. on one of our right. own towns. Mm-hmm. Mm. Right. Um, I wonder how many others we haven't heard of yeah. and that we won't know of. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, they found the grave, mass grave, the other day. Yeah, which is, Tulsa. yeah, and it's trending on Twitter because of oh, the really? show. Uh, yeah, Tulsa. Because of Watchmen. So it was trending, and they found these bones recently, like yesterday, the day before. The day I was just like, I'm going to go run for office in my neighborhood that wants to keep the name of the Ku Klux Klan. Now, I know mm. that brings it back to that, but I just mean that it feels to me that that was why I was like, listen, stop acting like this. Th- it wasn't horrible, and that it's still not. It's not still horrible. We, we they just right. arrested someone that was planning to bomb a white supremacist that was planning to bomb a, a synagogue here in Denver. Right. So I just don't understand why people are not like up in arms about it. Mm-hmm. White so, people, <laughs> white people, but not just white people, actually. Right, like my city council person, Chris Herndon. He thinks it's fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. Uh, for, so, uh, Rebecca, you are you and Danilo, you know the work that I do. I work with a lot of groups across the country. Um, we're doing culture shift work within the organizations, um, and part of my part of my struggle personally has been that we're trying to shift. We're trying to help people within broken institutional norms that. It's hard it's hard to support people who are hurting in a toxic work environment when the toxic work environment is really what needs to change. It's not necessarily the people. It's the structures and all of the structures that are in place for business, profit, for profit or nonprofit are white supremacist constructs. Um, and so they dehumanize people, period. Um, and what I've been wrestling with is this idea that we all have a specific like psychoses or pathology that we are so it's so deep for us that we are like we deny things that are actually happening within our bodies um, and in our emotions and then we sort of move that way through the world and so me as a person who has a different psychoses than say you Rebecca I'm like la 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 and we we kind of interact and then you sort of come from the place of your psychoses. And I'm like, that's so weird because I don't have that psychoses, right? And so I'm like, huh, well, let me try to explain to you my perspective on on what's happening here. And then your psychoses will not allow you to hear anything I'm saying at all. Like you, you have, you cannot, there is no way. And so it feels like to me on a grander scale that there is something around whiteness that is a collective psychosis that 
we're trying to interact on an intellectual and emotional level, heart level. And there's this, this general like, what? What are you talking about? That's not happening. And you know how that feels because we all have been there when we've talked to people and they're like, that's not what's happening at all. What? No, that's just, there's just this blanket denial. And mm-hmm. for me at this point, it's like, I can't, I can't keep giving you medicine for something that you're not even willing, like you're not even taking it. You're like, there's nothing wrong here. I'm fine. It's the struggle within myself. Like, how can I move folks to a different place if they're not even acknowledging that they're in a <laughs> in a different place and that they're even that there's even a problem? Um, have so, you have you seen anyone overcome that? Like, I guess in your work, have you had anyone who was behind that wall and was able to? come out from behind it and receive that medicine yes that is yes i have seen it happen what did it take to get to that point yeah because because we can get it on an individual basis the problem that we have and why it's become so exhausting is because it's individual by individual and each new individual is like we got to start from scratch Mm -hmm. and they start Mm -hmm. with you're wrong. That's not happening. Mm-hmm, I don't know mm-hmm. anything about it. And if you're going to talk to me about it, you have to use these white parameters to talk mm-hmm. to me so you don't hurt my feelings. But really, it's not happening. Yeah. And we have to start from scratch with each person and walk them through and walk them through and be patient and don't, you know, get any kind of attitude <laughs> as yeah. they keep telling us we're crazy. But- Finally, that person gets it. And then the next person is, what? No, I never heard of that. No, you're going to have to start to hold my hand. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm running for office, so I can do it (laughs) all at once. (laughs) But can it be done all at once? That's why I'm asking. What what is it that lifts that veil for that one person? Can we scale it? So you did take work. I'm telling you, it takes Are we talking about fixing racism? Like the veil? Like Uh, scaling? Just in general, I, I think... Like you were saying, each person has their own individual things that are like someone who is not um, from a part of the queer culture Mm -hmm. has a hard time understanding when I talk about issues within the queer culture. Um, You know, somebody who is trans has difficulty explaining their life experience to somebody who is cisgender. But do they have difficulty explaining it or do we have difficulty hearing it? That. Yes, they mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they have difficulty explaining it because they're they're not willing to hear it. They don't see that there is a problem. Yeah. Um. So I think it's not just about racism. It's about all of it. All of it. Mm-hmm, Understanding mm-hmm. within humankind and as a species. Let's see. And so just to add, uh, uh, caller, <laughs> 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 that it is each individual, but there is also and there is also a collective consciousness. So we're not just dealing with people on individual levels. You have to. Di- I'm at the training. You have to. Dis- to- yeah, you have to. Right. You have to get them out of the matrix. Mm. Like yeah. you literally. Yeah. And what that yeah. takes is a complete and utter breakdown of their belief system, their value system. Their entire life has been a lie. Right. And when they see that and get that. There's a meltdown. It's an absolute yeah. necessity to yeah. get there. And I think I saw that in the video that you showed me earlier uh, when you're talking about that we 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 have to approach these or we approach these conversations with feelings, with emotions, with a different uh, level of communicating that when you were explaining to you what it feels like to be part of a community that does not respect or care about how you feel, whether it's that you're not feeling welcome or as a person of color uh, it doesn't feel safe per se, you know, to, to walk around. And you were talking from a place of feeling and as uh, very emotional and moving. And the first response that you got was no acknowledgement to that. But uh, are you calling us wh- uh, racist? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, just completely ignoring the fact that you were sharing. This is how you're making me feel. And I think there there isn't a capacity. And I think you're right. It's beyond uh, race uh, uh, for the oppressor and, and particularly in a system that you say we have to 
uh, become unbound of all of our chains to really understand uh, for that white man to be able to say, oh, wow, that's, that's how I'm making you feel. Mm -hmm. This is how I felt when you did that. There, there's just no possible uh, avenues for uh, or, or communication channels for that to happen until you start breaking down uh, these chains in patriarchy and racism yeah. and uh, all these other you know places, which all are all under white supremacy culture. Right. Like, that's I know for me, like when I was raised in a, an extremely conservative household, um, and yeah. so when I started to struggle with my queer identity. It did. It was like my entire world falling apart. And when that happened and I I was grappling with my own identity, I could also look around and see other people who were like, I'm hurting with, you know, my identity within this framework of a culture of a country. And so I have I think that intersectionality is the key to the empathy that we're looking for to be able to understand each other's struggles genius <laughs> <laughs> no, but, and without but without putting a, a hierarchy on it that's something right. i always mm -hmm. want people to know like yeah i'm sorry that i i am actually sorry that me calling you a racist made you feel bad i'm sorry for that feel that's what i think my guilt is about it's like because i actually don't want to just like hurt people right. but i'm trying to explain something to you and so i feel bad for you but you have to know that you're doing this thing that's really hurting me and you think you're not that's what it, mm -hmm. to me it comes down to is if someone's like, I'm not a racist and I'm like, but you are. You have the, you, <laughs> actions, you have the actions of, of a racist. racist. Yeah, so I tried if to call out the behavior like in my speech, right? <laughs> yeah. I tried to call out yeah. the behavior. I'm like, well, you voted to keep a name that you know is bothering a certain population. What other conclusion can I draw? Yeah. But, but some of it is, again, just the even... It is even just the the education of what the issue is and that it could exist. And so my example mm -hmm. with um, queer culture is uh, I think it was like uh, I think it was 2014 or so. Um, I was uh, in a gaming forum and someone was asking for pronouns to be programmed in so that gender fluid people could mm -hmm. switch pronouns you know, mm -hmm. fluidly. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, what is that? That's not even a thing. I don't even know. I've never even heard of this. Um, and it took like several days for some, because I was like, I understand uh, trans, but I don't know what this gender fluid thing is. There's not enough gender fluid people for this even to be an issue because mm -hmm. um, I'd never heard of that. I don't know anybody. Nobody right. was talking about it around me. Um, and then after a couple of days, I was like, oh, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> if that is actually a thing, then yeah, they should definitely mm -hmm. support that. Um, so some of it is just bringing awareness that it's even actually an issue yeah. for those people who are in their own bubble and don't know. Yeah, but you yeah, have like, to be disconnected offends, from the Matrix first to even start to process little, like it's impossible to get it all at the one at one hit. It's overwhelming. You can't do it. And it's it. not just intellectual. You're asking for an emotional intelligence and response yeah. to be able to hold and process something that just is not there. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering if part of the resistance there is that, um, you know, if, if you like you were saying with uh, the, the gaming example, um, you were like, oh, I don't know that many people or are there that many people that this is a thing for? Like, how many people does it have to affect, you know, to be, um, I guess, insulted by it or like you were saying with the name situation, um, that it, mm -hmm. it's something that bothers you. How many people does it have to bother to justify a systemic change? In some people's mind could be that it's like, oh, well, if one person is like using the word the offends me, like then we have to change our entire language because the word the, you know, like... That I hate that slippery slope line. That Fuck is, that. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Yeah. Tell but me why I hate it. It's not a slippery slope. Yeah. It I mean, what's the problem? Mm -hmm. Language morphs constantly. Yes. Right. So All we don't time. say, we don't call thee and thou no more. Right. 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 And nobody is like out here in the streets, you know, picketing. So, I mean, that was a very cursory, right, um, example, like a word 
the, which we use in everything. Um, and and so I would love to hear, like, like if you write a book about that, that would be great. Cause I, cause now I'm like, well, what is that person experiencing? Why is the, a pro, right? Like I want to mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. but that's because I've been the one who hasn't been heard. Right. So my empathy has already grown. I've been doing this work for a long time. If we're starting at a a level where people aren't even they don't have any empathy for anyone outside of who looks like them or who is in their, you know, immediate circle. The key is empathy. And if you don't have that muscle, we all can have it, but we have to practice it. And so for me, when you mentioned that, I was like, huh, that's a that would be a challenge to not use the anymore, but I'm up for it. Let's do it. If it's going to help somebody feel whole. I'm literally sitting here trying to think of how <laughs> I would stop using beep, beep word. Like, yeah, sorry. It would but be that's hard. what it takes. Right. Yeah. And you're, and this is even like, not, this is just a const- construct where there's like mm-hmm. an example. Like we're just thinking. I'm hearing for myself the conclusion that I've come to um, on this situation is that it comes down to if it's based on an empathetic situation, then, yeah, it's worth it. But the 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 slippery slope of it being like everybody being like, oh, well, that offends me. It's like it genuinely needs to be something that affects your wholeness right you can't just be like oh the word the offends me today and it's going to be and tomorrow right so then we talked about this on a different podcast but the difference between being offended and being hurt or harmed Mm. so we can get we get offended by a lot of things right we have built up some things that are in our lives that are sacred and that you can't touch that and if you do then i am offended but there are other things in that we do in our lives that harm other people. Mm. And I think that's the difference. I appreciate if the breakdown. Yeah. I'm mm-hmm. actively like saying that is harming me. That is affecting my mental health, my physical health. And you're still well, prove like, it. Yeah, you're still saying <laughs> that's next. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the difference because unfortunately offense is not the same as harmed. Mm. Put that on a shirt for real mm. though. I like love that. I can do that. But because that that is a, I think that's a great distinction, because if you're like those people who are like, you call me a racist, I think I think they're just offended. Offended. And I'm saying I'm hurt. I'm really hurt by the fact that I don't want you to come to my house. I don't I don't want your children playing with my children. Mm-hmm. Like, think about what it takes for me to say something that hurtful, because I certainly wouldn't want someone yeah, to say that to me. And it's denial, too, right? To be okay with that name, a denial to, you know, admit and to accept what the Ku Klux Klan stands for. And that's harmful. And it has harmed historically, and it continues to harm today. It's a huge denial of the fact that the harm is still continuing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think they're like, oh, the Ku Klux Klan, that was back in the day. You know, I don't see anyone running around in hoods. So they're not around. Now they just wear uniforms. Mm -hmm. And they are in the police force. And And if you think they're not, you don't know what you're talking about. And that's why Watchmen, to me, was I had such a strong reaction to it. because. And then just the next day, then you saw there was a whole squad in West Virginia doing the Heil Hitler Mm -hmm. salute. You know, it's disturbing, not surprising. No, I know, I know, I know. And I say it all the time. Yeah, I'm not it's... shocked, but I'm always appalled. So, mm-hmm. well, I, I want to jump in and say I think we have to factor in power here, because I think when you call white people racist, the nice white people, they are hurt as well. They are hurt by that word because they think that they're not. Um, mm-hmm. But there's a power factor in there that's different. So we're saying we're hurt and we can't do anything about it because we don't have any power. One of the, this was maybe 20 years ago, um, a coworker of mine um, said, uh, left-handed people are the most discriminated uh, group in America. Uh, (laughs) The group most. And I was like, what? (laughs) I was like, what are you talking about? Nobody, like, I'm not, I don't hate left-handed people. I don't even, he's like, yeah, you don't think about it. But, the mice that we get at stores all designed for right-handed people. 
uh, you know, scissors, you know, they're all, you know, you might have one pair of scissors in the office for left-handed people. And if that disappears, what happens? Yeah. Notebooks um, with the spiral on the left side. That's hateful. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was recently in a laundromat and I realized that all of the doors that open out on the washing machines, when they open out, they're designed to be easy for right-handed people to open, but not left-handed, just the way the handle is shaped. Yeah, once you're aware, <laughs> you start paying attention. Yeah. Um, and you're like, man, 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 yeah, this is right. Like, left-handed people... When I so I'm an, I I do IT so sometimes I go around and I fix people's computers and you know when I'm done I try and rearrange their desks back you know so it's comfortable for them and I found myself wanting to leave the mouse on the right side of the com- of, of the of the desk and then I have to remember oh was that where I found it because <laughs> yeah. if it's on the left side I feel like oh they didn't mean to leave it there I must have pushed it over there. And I'll put it so either way, right is that where I found it? Yeah, but right. you still want to because you you're like, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to inconvenience this person. Or, now I have and... to think about it. Yeah, I have to think actively think about it because I'm sure they're like, why why do I come back to my desk and I have to move my mouse back over to the left side? Every, right. Like, and on the know. complete opposite flip side of that. Um, three of the people sitting at this table wear glasses. Do you wear contacts? No. So the most accommodated um, disability that is seamless, seamlessly accommodated in our society is vision, like mild vision impairment, right? Like it's built mm-hmm. into our assur- insurance. There's like people are like, oh, you're wearing glasses. Like it's not a big deal to accommodate that disability. So it's interesting to like point that out to people to be like we can do this we can be accommodating at every single level to um, make sure that the way that someone is different doesn't have to exclude them from society but but again it's, it's, it's that awareness because the thing that is messing people up is I don't take people and this doesn't affect me, so I'm not even aware that this is a thing. And when you try to pull people out of that matrix, which is a kind of great analogy, people mm-hmm, flip mm-hmm. out because they're yeah. like, no, I'm in the real world. I'm not I in the I keep going back this to that. Real. Yeah. It's poignant that you bring up the left-handed community because there's actually there were actual times in history mm. where left-handed people were killed for being left-handed. Mm. They were, yeah, they were tortured for not being right-handed. Mm. Um, and and as an ambidextrous person, I am highly offended. So great, mm-hmm. thank you for yeah. bringing. Well, <laughs> and even even still to this day, in um, uh-huh. a lot of Middle Eastern countries, you can't do so, you're not allowed to do certain things with your left hand. You can't yes. mm-hmm. um, like handle money or something like that with your left hand. Mm-hmm. You can't. What if you shake someone's hand with your left hand? You can't because it's seen as the dirty hand. So. So in those cultures, you eat with your right hand and you wipe with your left hand. Right. So that's if you're left-handed and you're listening to this, we support you. Yeah, we support you. <laughs> we support you. Mm-hmm. No, because um, I'm actually my husband is also is ambidextrous and my mm-hmm. kid is left-handed, but he does the same thing that my husband does. Like he'll just switch depending on who's Mm -hmm. next to him or or whatever. Like, he can Mm -hmm. use both hands. And we told him at the school to make sure that, you know, we're like, well, he writes with his left hand, you know, because the way that even the grips, the little eraser grips Mm -hmm. and and all that Mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah, Yeah. my partner's Mm -hmm. left-handed. Yeah. Yeah. But she cooks right-handed because she Mm -hmm. was in culinary school and they taught right-handed. See? So can we we then talk about culture of domination uh, Mm -hmm. within this uh, right and wrong? and people growing up within their own matrix of this is how you live your life. So if people are taught to think a certain way about race and then you're telling them they're wrong, um, and you are also happen to be part of the dominant group, uh, you're not used to having to change your opinion. You're not used to having right. to uh, doubt or question your first gut instinct. And then you're being asked to do that by a less dominant group and you don't even recognize it, <laughs> right? right? Until you're uh, willing to uh, really reflect on the culture, uh, uh, the, the patriarchal culture of being stronger, of being right, of not being wrong. 
um, and being dominant, whether it's uh, white male uh, culture or, or, or white supremacy or in capitalism, uh, you know, this, uh, survival of the fittest. If you're invested in that, it's going to be very difficult to hear. Um, does a caller have anything? Caller. To- Caller, do you have any? No, we, we, we still are going to have to have a dedicated Watchmen podcast. But I feel like that mm. was dedicated, wasn't it? Oh, no. Uh, <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> it goes so Everybody's going to have to finish watching the whole season. Ooh, that's a great segue because episode four is going to be about representation in pop culture. So we're going to be talking about who's playing our roles, why they're playing them. And um, we talking about The Handmaid's Tale. We talking about Queen and Slim. We're gonna be talking about Harriet Tubman. We got all kinds of stuff coming up for you. I just wanna thank all my wonderful guests for coming on Off Color, so fantastic. Off Color is a Tan Tigress production made possible by Tan Tigress and listeners like you. So please leave us a five star review. Five stars only, I'm not kidding. I'm really not kidding about that. Five stars only. And uh, please follow us on social media. We're trying to get that Twitter popping. Off Color Pod on Twitter. On Facebook, we are Off Color Podcast. And later. Jenny, I just want to go on record to say that Janice Matsko is a fantastic producer and I love working with her because I cannot imagine trying to wrangle my ass. (laughs) And cut.